we started off a little bit uh, in the intro talking about what the uh, what the connection is between the suicide club and the Cockney Society and, uh, and Telecom uh, And for me, that's a kind of that's, kind of, that's a very per sort of personal trajectory because uh, because Telecom was only founded in 2006. But during the period that uh, that John was describing, I was also already quite active in, in, in many in many projects. Um, Including a lot of the projects that, uh, that John mentioned, at least the Toronto, uh, the Toronto impact that those projects had, and uh, and as well as a lot of the projects in the uh, in the ex exhibition that, uh, that John's put together, uh, my collective in Toronto, my pre telecommunication collective, Ideas and Tactics, uh, hosted with the listed stuff. We hosted Cacophony Society stuff. We hosted all kinds of all kinds of things that had to do back with that back with that time, including uh, Happy Clown, which was a kind of a elite crashing project, uh, Idio Audio, which was uh, um, uh, independent music uh, sort of organizing collective that did pirate radio and lots of events. Um, and uh, during that period of time, uh, I really kind of believed that uh, the internet uh, was not only this interesting technology that was fun to use and promoting uh, kinds of uh, Cool things in the company side, other projects that were going on, but it was kind of like an existential um, threat to capitalism itself. That uh, that it uh, that it uh, it's embodied it's embodied forms um, the, the the kinds of communication enabled the peer to peer uh, unrestricted communication enabled kind of went hand in hand to this like what I you know what I felt was a massive uprising. It was going on all around me at the time, from culture jamming to reclaim the streets. Like uh, there, there, there was a period of time in the late '90s where it really felt like big change was coming, and uh, and the internet uh, was 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 a part of that, uh, or seemed a part of that. Um, unfortunately, uh, some of you may remember that it didn't work out so well. The, uh, our uh, our massive anti-globalization movement was literally clubbed to death. Uh, the internet was entirely bought by capital and transformed into centralized uh, platforms like Facebook. Uh, George Bush administration happened, 9-11 happened, and, and the mood completely changed. And, and, uh, and so by the time I arrived in Berlin, um, I wanted to do something that, uh, that addressed some of the contradictions that were, that, that, that were built in to the practices that, uh, that, we were, that we were celebrating before, and that's why I started Telecommunistin. And, uh, and eventually, Baruch joined, and uh, over, the last, uh, over the last five years, we developed uh, an even stronger body of work than, the, than we started out with to to kind of address this. So the, the kind of core uh, mission, if you will, of uh, telecommunistin is to address the, the social relations that are embedded in communication technologies. So to look at some of the kind of utopian ideals that we project on them and compare them with the actual realities. And the, and the way that we do this is, is we create kind of these absurd uh, communication platforms, which we then we present in our festivals as startups of some kind, and then we're trying to promote them. So we have websites and videos and installations that kind of like promote these absurd communication technologies as if they were like the next uh, Twitter or something like that. And uh, and 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 uh, unlike other artworks, uh, um, you know, continuing on the kind of techniques that we were using in the, in the mid '90s, our artworks always involve somehow getting you to do something, somehow getting you to be part of the network, so, so that the network is composed of the people that uh, come to see the exhibit. So they become, they become nodes in the network itself. And, uh, and, and, and in doing so, we demonstrate different topologies to start talking about it. Because I think one of the reasons, um, uh, one of the reasons that the internet was so easily subverted, and one of the reasons that, uh, um, uh, you know, that things like privacy are such issues today, is that, is that, is that uh, computers and networks are very mysterious to people. They don't really understand how they work. So Julian Oliver talks about how, like, if you ask a regular person how a um, piece of mail goes from their, you know, from their hands to somewhere, somewhere else in the world, they can give you a pretty good explanation of like how the mail system works. But if you ask the same person how an email gets to where it's going, or how, or how a Facebook message gets to where it's going, it's shrouded in mystery. So in order to allow people to kind of think politically about, about topologies and communication systems, we kind of make them part of the system. And, uh, and so the work here today, I guess, will be the most, the, the, the most central. Uh, Octo and Brute will say some stuff there, and we'll kind of bounce back and forth, and we'll show you all of our miscommunication technologies, uh, starting with Octo here. Yeah, so... Um the project that we're showing here at, uh, at the Schutz Gallery, uh, downtown Ljubljana, thanks to uh, Tatiana and uh, Yanis and the whole team uh, from Axioma. 
uh, for putting it together in a wonderful uh, shape, which we won't show you now. We'll leave you the surprise for now. Um, this is a, a new iteration. I think it's the fourth iteration of the Octo um, uh, project, let's say, uh, which was actually derived from uh, technologies uh, developed over a long time by another uh, telecommunist uh, member, Jeff Mann, who's done a lot of work with vacuum cleaners and, uh, and uh, drainage pipe. Um, and uh, uh, robotic type objects, uh, pathetic objects, um, uh, which demonstrate uh, the limits of uh, technological optimism. Um, the uh, Octo project started uh, with uh, Tatiana, actually, and uh, Christopher Gansing, and uh, a group of architects from a, a company called Raum Labor in, uh, in Berlin, and the whole uh, Transmediala Festival, um, and some carpenters, and uh, it was a huge team. Um, helping us to make this enormous um, uh, installation, uh, which was at the Haus der Kultur und der Welt in, um, in Berlin. Uh, it, it took over the whole uh, building, just like uh, uh, Octo uh, P7CES uh, does here at the uh, Schutz Gallery. Um, again, as uh, Dimitri said, uh, Octo is a fictional company. It's a fictional layer on our practice, in this case, it's uh, like a competitor to uh, Amazon uh, billing, like the, the future of communication is now physical, you know, email is boring, uh, we're going to like get the real palpable, sensible stuff that you, you, you can't get from email, and you can't get from Facebook, you're going to get it directly in your hands and uh, you can get your mother's cooking, you know, delivered directly to you. Um, again, um, we have a very nice video um, here with uh, some of... Jonas's brilliant animations. You can see we, we launched it as a uh, crowd uh, funding or a crowd investment uh, opportunity uh, where you could um, uh, join and you can see that we had a very uh, high goal because the, one, of, one of the critiques in that is that um, you know these, these things can only be funded by uh, large scale capital uh, and uh, uh, small um, uh, 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 situations like uh, normal crowd funding. Kickstarter. Three, three years later, we haven't gotten our 99 billion yet, so uh, there's still opportunities. There's a lot of opportunities here. There's a very inform informational website here, which uh, can give you especially uh, some things like, you know, how do I invest and things like that. The critique in this one, of course, is that, okay, we, we, we offer you these, this fantastic new service, Octo offers you, uh, this fantastic new service, but the service is centralized it, it, to ensure High quality service, of course. We don't. We don't and security. Like security, yes. So we have. Um, uh, so every message that has to be uh, that is sent through the system, you have all these remote stations, comes back comes back through a central station. At which point, there's an operator who can like uh, take capsules out of the system, look at what's inside, censor them, insert advertising. Uh, do any kind of inspection. And, and, and the, 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 the labor theater is also a big part of uh, what we do, making the people in the audience and the people in the gallery that are, that are, that are works, our, our installations always involve a lot of work for those, for those that are doing it. So this, and this of course is meant to challenge this kind of uh, uh, utopian idea of the immaterial labor of the internet and how the internet is somehow this weightless thing that exists outside of the natural universe and isn't based <laughs> on mining and electricity and labor. So, so we want to make the labor very, uh, very evident so we try to make as much of it as possible. So you can see this uh, lovely uh, designed uh, um, console here by, uh, by Jeff Mann. Um, uh, and this has the uh, two vacuum cleaners inside. One is pushing and one is pulling. And uh, when, you, when you send the messages in, uh, they, they, will, uh, they have to connect the, uh, this large patch cable here to the, uh, to the device. <laughs> We're 
still uh, recruiting operators, by the way, for a Scooch uh, Gallery. So if you'd like to be an operator, you get a free uh, Octo t-shirt. <laughs> and, and valuable work experience for the future. And to uh, let you know how what it looks like inside the Octo uh, tubes, uh, we somebody put a, a GoPro. Uh, Octo at Transmediale, uh, the official miscommunication platform of uh, Transmediale. We did a uh, uh, Vittore, uh, who is also here. Um, hey, uh, Vittore. Um, uh, was uh, an important participant in the, in the original instance of it with the uh, new pneumatic circus. And, um, and then uh, uh, Vittore took it upon himself to uh, redo the Octo. Uh, where? Viareggio, and you can see this is uh, this is Vittori's version here uh, with the octo coming out and uh, sticking out. Actually, the octo was also adopted by the uh, Chaos Computer Club to do the uh, Chaos uh, Communication Congress, which happens every uh, end of the year in Hamburg. Uh, they do a very elaborate, very hacky uh, version of it. Without, I don't have any pictures of that. Uh, I would have to call them up. But um, yeah, it's called Seidenstrasse, Silk Road. And uh, if anybody's interested to see uh, one more in action, there's a, it, it'll be at the... Uh, at they, the they, 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 got some, they got some press with that by uh, signing the first uh, Bitcoin donation to WikiLeaks over uh, pneumatic tube. I'll, I'll try to. That's true. <laughs> um, we did a... Uh, so just to show another system, uh, we did a, uh, a decentralized system. Um, this is the, uh, from um, Athens. In Greece, uh, we, we, we set up a system that uh, did not go through a central station where we put the vacuum cleaners in these, these boxes. And uh, every, every uh, apartment in this uh, space had their own system. It was a very, very chaotic system, as you can see. Um, it also went across the street uh, to the, the neighboring uh, cafe. We were ordering coffees uh, through Octo. That was always an ambition to like, you know, show people that. I'm sure. Of course, in Greece, you, you could do things that we can't do in Germany, like run a, a tube over a power line like that. that was, uh, or like it, just uh, we didn't ask any permission. It was quite there. Uh, and but, but of course, uh, even though it was decentralized, all participants had to sign exclusivity agreements with us. But uh, you know, they were only allowed to connect authorized authorized use to the network and not duplicate any services we were providing ourselves. Well, and yeah, of course. Uh, this was a, one of uh, this was built as Octo apps, whereby you could like emancipate yourself from your terrible job by you know doing something you like, uh, contributing to this uh, this uh, this economy of pneumatically delivered goods. So if you make I don't know jewelry or whatever, uh, you can like, you can be sending it through the the Octo apps. Of course, we would take a, a cut of all of the. Uh, what you make. Um, and this was, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of photos of people screaming and yelling uh, in confusion because uh, it was extremely hard to organize this as, as people who work in very flat uh, topological organizations know that uh, sometimes it's, it's really hard to get everybody to work together at the same time. Uh, it requires a lot of diligence um, and dedication. This is the project we are uh, showing uh, here. It's the new version, uh, the enterprise security version of uh, Octo. It's for, for offices, really, designed for institutions, offices, institutions and offices. Um, it, it has this, uh, this, scroll down, oh yeah, right. It has this uh, revolutionary caps lock technology, which the capsules are, uh, are, are well uh, scrutinized and uh, watched on every step of their, their way through the uh, transport system. And I'll show you the uh, and of course, it's all It's all controlled through, through an app, so you can't just use the system. You have to use this app, the system. You have to have the enterprise pin. This allows your corporate IT department to, to fully control who has access to the system and to monitor who's sending what to who, et cetera. Um, yeah, so this is the, uh, this is the, uh, the enterprise interface yeah. that, you, that you have to use to, uh, to request empty capsules and to, and to send them. As you, as you see, it's, uh, 
like the pneumatic tubes themselves, it harkens back to, uh, to a different era of, uh, of interface design as if you were connecting to a terminal on a, on a time-sharing system or a mainframe system. Yeah, so if you want to send a capsule or request, first you would request a capsule, you just type request, and you type, type the station you're at, and then it'll say that, uh, uh, show, the monitor, yeah. show the monitor where you get the, um, so. Uh, the, the attendant, the uh, octo employee, or uh, uh, with, for which we're recruiting now, um, it will be watching this uh, um, screen, which says now, you see, we got a capsule request from station five. So it's a, it's a software system with a hardware system, and it's, uh, it's uh, dominating the, the Scooch Gallery and uh, making those same sounds, too. It's uh, exactly the same um, uh, tube and vacuum power. Should we move to a, uh, another project, a previous project? Let's go back in time. Um, so we can, um, yeah. Thimble, right? Thimble, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a, there, we can do a pretty comprehensive uh, article about our practice in Tatiana's book, in the Network Disruption uh, book. And, uh, and we kind of like to frame the projects as being kind of like oppositional, right? So you have, uh, well, let's watch the video first, I'll talk about it. to the, like the, the first wave of uh, privacy concerns and centralization concerns and monopoly concerns around Facebook. So there was all kinds of projects being launched. Diaspora, like Friendster, like all kinds of millions of, uh, um, millions of different kind of uh, projects that were being launched to attempt to, to, attempt to decentralize um, uh, Facebook. And, uh, and, and, and to us, this, um, this seemed problematic because, because of course, uh, our critique starts with the decentralized internet and how it got centralized. So, so the prospects that in order to decentralize it, we just need to create a more different decentralized Facebook seem wrong because there was there must have been a reason why it became centralized in the first place. And so, in order to in order to kind of uh, um, address that, actually, this history is backwards. That the internet was already decentralized, and that these new platforms are centralizing it. That we don't need to create a new, new decentralized version of this, like kind of cargo cult versions of, uh, of Facebook that are decentralized. Um, so, so we created uh, yet another startup, Thimble, that uh, that was a decentralized social platform. And and you, you may have noticed in there that it says it doesn't need any software. And the reason why it doesn't need any software is because it's entirely based uh, around um, a protocol from the 1970s called uh, called called Finger. So that so the the it, the Finger protocol already existed since the 1970s. It was already a way to like publish uh, publish uh, status updates uh, that's been running for decades, right? And so and so uh, we want to address the question of like why don't things like that, um, uh, you know, flourish, and why do things like Facebook flourish in their place? And, uh, and so the, the, the critique that we offer in the manifesto and in that project and others is that, of course, these are economic reasons. And this is, and, and this is also with Thimble is where we really started to develop this idea of, so, of social fictions, of creating products that technically worked because there was nothing about Thimble that didn't technically work, right? It's just a client, the finger protocol, which has been around forever. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't work because it's, uh, in order for it to exist, the, the social economic conditions in which it exists have to change. The, the environment of uh, capitalist ownership of, of media platforms that requires centralization in order to make profit has to change. And we have to find new ways of, of building and supporting uh, communication platforms. So this is why, so this is why Thimble is a, is a social fiction. So, um, so, that's, so that's kind of very much in contrast with the kind of dystopian social fiction of Octo, which is a completely centralized system where we're directly critiquing uh, where we're directly critiquing um, uh, existing platforms by sort of illustrating their true nature more physically with vacuum tubes instead of instead of with like pneumatic tubes instead of instead of uh, software. Um, uh, Thimble is an implicit critique of kind of uh, um, unfortunately naive alternatives that think that that think that uh, all we need to do to overcome these 
multi-billion dollar uh, organizations is simply is simply write a different version of that in a different way with with, with no funding, with no support, with no uh, right. That it's just a matter of, of code. And it's still seen as uh, by a lot of people as being like a real alternative. Absolutely. It's listed even on Wikipedia, I think, as a as an alternative uh, social network. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, and as some people joke, it's actually more real than the ones that claim to be real because it, it's, it, you know, it actually, it actually works. It actually works. <laughs> this is um, one of the uh, uh, like Twitter-like feeds that uh, that was built on the Thimble or Cloud Protocol. This is Thimble simple, simple thinking. This is one of the one of the clients that was made uh, by some random person uh, that uh, decided to make a client for this new protocol that we <laughs> that we established. So this is by the had like a global timeline and known users and sort of had like. A, but of course, this is not a centralized thing. So this the the, the list of users that's on this timeline is just the ones that are known about by this. Uh, by this particular instance, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it can't be a global list because you can't know uh, what the global list is. So we got 10 minutes. We'll move on to Okay. Yeah. Um, another uh, a question we deal with uh, more intensively as we go along is, uh, you know, why, well, another reason why we, we can't have the internet we want is also uh, the question why we can't have the handsets we want, why we have uh, this, this situation now, which is uh, uh, increasingly common, where we inc uh, find that the the, um, the the equipment that we're using itself is spying on us. Is a is a privacy there are privacy issues there. There are vulnerabilities, and why is it happening again and again? You know why why do we have this like hope? Okay, we're going to solve it, and then it, it the hope is is uh, is dashed uh, by circumstances. And of course, uh, the uh, our, our materials critique will will say that well, of course we can't uh, have uh, liberating technologies which are built under conditions which themselves are highly hegemonic, highly hier hierarchical, and abusive and violent even, uh, and uh, pers in persistent in ways that uh, have uh, not changed since uh, the Middle Ages in some cases. So I have um, this project called iMine, which is a, uh, it was a very simple game for uh, cell phones. Um, in this game, uh, you play uh, the uh, miner mining the minerals for your cell phone, and the game is ex extremely uh, simple. And it, uh, I have a little video. Where is that video now? Oh, maybe here. You kind of shake the uh, phone, and you get a gram of mineral. And then uh, you just shake the phone, and you get a gram of mineral. And uh, that's all about what you can do with the. Um, uh, the game uh, until you die. So and what, so it's a, it, it tries to uh, like uh, you do actually have to physically quite work quite hard to get that one gram, uh, and uh, after a while uh, you uh, either get tired and you stop the game for a while or you uh, you have to um, uh, mourn the uh, death of your character. Each character that you create uh, you have to name it and give it a birthplace and everything. There's a little bit of an elaborate identification ritual with the with the characters too and uh, yes so that the idea is that um, uh, um, we cannot have um, utopian or um, uh, another form of world without addressing the conditions at the base of the production chain in electronics there is a old version of it that's still kind of operated but Operating anyway, you don't really get very far, and it's it's a it's a um, uh, an instance of what we call dismalware, which is a kind of a software which uh, in in English we have this word dismal. I don't know what the word is in in Slovenian, but it's kind of miserable ware, and it's like a, it's like software which just is not happy it, to be there in the first place, and uh, it just it's actually not a very fun uh, uh, project, and uh, like. Uh, uh, it's, it's really hard to promote, and actually, I had a had a problem with the the yes men because they they told me that it's it's not viral enough, and I said, well, I don't want to go viral with this because it would simplify the message, and the message is incredibly complex and and uh, and miserable. So uh, we we couldn't come to terms with uh, um, going viral on this one. So R fifty nine. Okay, so R fifty nine. You want to? Yeah. So uh, so yeah. Like so, I mine is a kind of an implicit critique of the mining history and the supply chains in uh, in production, but uh, also around the same time, 
uh, we had like uh, the so-called Arab Spring and 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 uh, and and, and the, the manifestation of Twitter revolutions and uh, and uh, and this sort of thing, where like uh, where like PR departments of Twitter and Facebook were presenting uh, their platforms as if they were actually causing revolutions abroad, and overthrowing and overthrowing states, and uh, you know, creating revolutionary conditions. And uh, you know, we wanted to emphasize that actually, like that organization on the ground is what creates those conditions, not uh, not the not the mediums they happen to use because they're there, right? Uh, you know, so so you know, in the, during the Iranian Revolution. Um, uh, people were distributing messages on on cassette tapes, but nobody ever called it the cassette tape revolution, right? And and, and you know, like, uh, and people have been using technology as in the course of their activities always, but the technology has never been given the agency before of like that it actually caused the revolution, not the organization of the people. So we wanted to create such an such an emancipatory technology, one that would allow people to mobilize communities. Uh, and so, uh, you know, going back into our like our toolkit of ancient technologies, we decided to uh, resurrect the phone tree, which was a, a technology that that, that um, in Canada would be used on a snow day. If you're if you weren't allowed to go to school because it was snowing, then it would be like every parent would have a list of five other parents, and then it would one one parent would call those five parents, and those five parents would call those five parents, until every parent had the message that uh, that that was a snow day. Um, Militaries used to use it for uh, mobilization of reserves. Uh, it was it was very common in pre-internet days as a way as a way to as a way to send send a message out to a community. So we wanted to you know kind of Twitterize it, make it into kind of an emancipatory platform. So we'll we'll, we'll play the promotional video for that now. As usual, it shows that you really do need a lot of uh, diligence uh, to be a, an activist. Uh, it's not uh, just a given. R15N. R15 and will help you get your message out. Go to R15 and sign in. Push the button on the R15 and website, and you'll be connected to a random person from your community. R15 and will then create an ad hoc telephone tree connecting random community members. As the community works together to spread the message, R15 and creates community engagement. There's no charge to you or your community. Try R15 and today. The revolutionization of communication. In using that, in using that work, R15N is is, is is probably the most antagonistic work ever made because it's like the whole exhibition is just meant to get your phone number, and then as soon as you call it, as soon as you put your phone number in it, it doesn't stop harassing you. Like you're, you start getting phone calls like every ten minutes from from random people, just hang ups, like 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 people's answering machine would phone you because it would just like call two numbers and stitch them together, like like, con like <laughs> continuously. Right, and so and so, it's uh, it really it really made it, it obvious how difficult it actually was to like make cohesive community. That it that is not something that you that that, that that a platform just magically creates. That it requires diligence, and we would always send people text messages that we required more diligence. <laughs> this is the uh, it's one of the installations at. Uh, at uh, the Hello. Oh, is it? It's for me. Hello. Again. It's for you. It's for me again. It's for me again. You see, uh, I mean, we've had uh, various responses to the, this project because uh, we showed it in, in Johannesburg and um, people really liked it because they got free phone calls because actually the, the, the system uh, always, you never have to pay. You're always called by the system and connected with a member of your community through the system. So you never have to call. So people got all these free phone calls and they, they look really important. Uh, and they're getting calls also from like Argentina and all, the, all over the place. So it was, uh, it was lots of fun. But in Paris, uh, they, there were people screaming to like, get me off this system. And I was like, oh. so we got a lot of flack from the curators. So we have, so um, I'm just going to quickly uh, introduce the number station. The number station, yeah. the number station video, and then mm -hmm. I guess we'll move on. Um, so Dead Swap is, uh, is a 2009 work, and in, in that context, uh, file sharing was uh, was kind of a really big deal. And uh, in the hacker community, we were trying to invent ever more like uh, obscure uh, ways to safely share files. Uh, uh, you know, under the under the illusion that under the illusion that if we just had the right technology, we could we could evade laws and police and and and, and, and that kind of thing. 
And, and, uh, and so we wanted to emphasize it's more than about technology, it's about operational security, and that you're more likely to get caught because of how you behave than, than because of the software you're using. And operational security is really hard. It's a really difficult thing. So we created DeadSwap, which is a file sharing system that existed uh, on, 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 at that time, one USB stick. The more recent one has several USB sticks, but the original one only had one USB stick. So it was uh, the, uh, at any given time. So that was, uh, the, all the files were on one USB stick. And, uh, and, and the way you shared them was you hit this USB stick in public space and then used a, an anonymizing SMS gateway that we were running to tell the next person in the hop uh, where they had hidden it. So they got a secret agent manual that explained uh, operational security to them. And, um, and, so, and so they had to kind of hide the sticks and, uh, and find them again and send text messages to kind, of, to, kind of, to kind of navigate. So you kind of realize that this is really quite difficult. It's quite difficult to, to if, you, if you really think through all the ways you can get caught um, in such a system. But it's also quite a lot of fun. So it's, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it is in the spirit of kind of like urban game playing, right? And so, um, and so the next work that we made on the similar thing, we, 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 we made a little bit more dismal. Uh, um, which is called Number Station. Uh, yeah, the DeadSwap, DeadSwap.net, if you want to run a DeadSwap network on your own, it's really easy. You just go to DeadSwap.net, you download the software, you put it on your phone, and only one phone is required to run the whole network. Everybody, can, everybody, everybody communicates through SMS. Completely offline. Yeah, it's completely offline, right? It doesn't require internet access. It's, oh, it's a purely an SMS-based uh, uh, coordination system, and the data is on USB stick. Um, and then, and and then so, and and, the, and so, number station is also on operational security, but uh, but this time we wanted to, uh, you know, especially post Snowden, everybody's interested in cryptography now, and and so and so we wanted on one hand, on one hand, to kind of uh, give people kind of a, a, a way to think about cryptography that's demystified, and another way to kind of like uh, um, uh, explore another social fiction that gets people to think about what like you know what real clandestine activity looks like. Because there's a lot of like clandestinity with like with like great exploits by an anonymous and lull sex. So this idea, the, the, this idea of kind of like the, the, the Star Wars uh, method of activism of like a, um, a, a clandestine small group uh, blowing up Death Star became kind of, became kind of more popular again. And, uh, and so of course we wanted to address it and problematize it a little bit. So we created this system to, uh, to, for, you know, for people that want to run their own uh, spy networks. Welcome candidate to your training session. This short film will help familiarize you with a technique you will need to participate in the trusted network. Visit telecommuniston.net slash numbers to find out how to tune in to the number station. Number stations repeat messages day and night. When you hear the card identification code for one of the cards in your possession, get your pad ready to interpret the code. Follow the scheme as indicated by the voice. Zero. Eight, one, one, so eight, uh, one, number stations were actually eight, like four, every uh, three, Cold War six, participant four, uh, four, had a number four, station, which was a shortwave or several number stations, so six, six, shortwave six, radio stations. Four, seven, C, three, eight, C, two, nine, A, one, A, B, one, B, C, one, C, C, one, D, A, four, zero, A, one, one C one two A four three C four four B four five C four six, Do the modular four, arithmetic mod ten. C, three, eight, Decipher the phone number to call for further instructions. Congratulations. You have completed the first phase of your training. Welcome to the numbers community. Right, so these uh, these number stations were actually shortwave radio stations during the Cold War, where people were um, uh, where spies were kept uh, kind of uh, simultaneously informed through these number broadcasts. They were just like uh, people reading numbers over the air, and they sure some of them are still in the air. Yeah, and uh, we tried we we tried to imitate the kind of the interference there a little bit, but again, yeah, um, uh, the uh, objective was to uh, get some uh, members uh, for our spy ring. Uh, our secure spy so if you want to join our clandestine spy ring, you have to go to number station, and then you have to wait for the broadcasts. Have your, just have your pads ready and uh, wait instructions. 